Hey friends of Wildland Fire, Darren Claybo here, State Fire Meteorologist for South Dakota. Uh, today I want to talk to you a little bit about the Haynes Index, or a Lower Atmosphere Severity Index for Wildland Fires. Don Haynes wrote a paper back in 1988, and here it is. Uh, it was published in the National Weather Digest, where he outlines uh, the LACI, the Lower Atmospheric Severity Index. Now it's kind of been known as the Haynes Index. But yeah, 1988 wrote a paper uh, trying to look at a couple of different things that may or may not be related to wildland fire growth. Um, and over the course of the years, it just got incorporated into the wildland fire lexicon. And now we're still using it, even though it's 2022, which is like, you know, 34 years later. Um, there's been some changes in technology in the past 34 years, which have rendered the Haynes Index obsolete. However, I think the Haynes Index was obsolete when he wrote it uh, because he really wasn't trying to get into the operations. That's right. Don Haynes himself did not want the Haynes Index to be in operations, and I'll outline what that means. So this is going to be the start of a three-part series. This one is just going to be an overview of the Haynes Index and why Don Haynes thinks the Haynes Index shouldn't be used operationally. Two is just going to be a discussion about stability as related to the Haynes Index because the Haynes Index is not a stability index in any way, shape, or form. And three, we'll talk a little bit about the historical misuse of the Haynes Index uh, with respect to its original formulation. So again, here is the Haynes Index. It's a five-page paper readily available online. Just Google a lower atmosphere severity index for wildland fire, and it, and it should pop up. Again, it was published in the National Weather Digest back in 1988. Um, it looks at two different atmospheric variables. It looks at an environmental lapse rate. Remember the lapse rate is just a temperature change with height. It also looks at a dew point depression, basically the temperature minus the dew point temperature, which gives us an idea of the relative amount of moisture in the air. Each of these, uh, the dew point depression and the lapse rate terms then, are given a value of one, two, or three depending on how steep the lapse rate is and depending on how big the dew point depression is. Um, the steeper the lapse rate, the higher the number, one, two, or three. Uh, the drier the atmosphere, the higher the number for the dew, points, or dew point depression side of things, one, two, or three. Then we add those numbers together and you get a Haynes index that ranges from two to six. And that's kind of where we're sitting at um, today. But, you know, there's a lot more that goes into it than, than just that. We really have to look at the, the, the paper itself to determine, hey, is this a valid index? Was it ever a valid index? And does it maintain its validity today? And I'm going to argue no on all of those accounts. We, we shouldn't be using the Haynes index for a lot of reasons. And let's kind of discuss what some of those are. So, how research gets into operations is that scientists, you know, write papers, they get published in journals, hopefully they go through the peer review process, uh, and then operational meteorologists will pick up parts of that, that research and then try to incorporate it into operations. And I think um, the Haynes Index was one of those things that just got incorporated into the operational world too quickly without proper vetting. Now, this is not a peer-reviewed publication. He published it in the National Weather Digest, again, to kind of start a conversation about how we could be looking at middle to lower tropospheric variables and how they related to big wildland fire growth. Um, so, you know, we have to analyze the methodology that goes into it. So what are the methods that go into creating the Haynes Index? Well, Don Haynes, what he did is he reached out to people. And, uh, and when I say people, he, he wanted to reach out to firefighters to, to assess, you know, hey, when did big blow-up fires occur? Because then I can look at some historical weather data related to those blow-up fires and see if there's any correlations there. And so Don Haynes um, said that the fire data were obtained by contacting wildland fire management units and requesting information on their worst fire situations over 20 years. So just from a first blush, that's not an objective way to, to retrieve data. If you're asking somebody about a worst fire situation, what's bad to me might not be bad to somebody else. You know, if there's not a threshold for a blow up fire, um, you know, maybe there were some unfortunate happenings uh, on one fire that made it a worst fire situation to one person. Uh, and maybe it wasn't the same to a, to a different person. Uh, so at any rate, they obtained these data and returns were provided uh, from 30 states 29 major fires in the western United States and 45 fires in the eastern United States. So really, the samples that were included in the Haynes Index um, 
were, were you know, like 65% of them were from the eastern part of the United States. And, and really, you know, a lot of firefighting in the U.S., the Haynes Index is used in the western part of the U.S., where this really wasn't to uh, developed for that's that's pretty interesting. So then, okay, so we we have these worst fire situations. From then, you take the fire situations, and and then Don Haynes compared it to um, weather data. And the weather data came from the Zero Zulu weather balloon launch that was nearest to the fire that was ostensibly blowing up. So Zero Zulu, depending on the time zone in the United States, it's like late afternoon, 5, 6, 7 p.m. time frame kind of thing. And so, you know, if you're looking at a late afternoon uh, radio song to, to correlate it to a, a fire blow up, you know, late afternoon, it might not be a bad thing. But recognize that the data that goes into the Haynes Index is exclusively from zero Z radio sound uh, or weather balloon it, uh, launches, and then it's compared to worst fire situations. Um, so continuing through this, you know, Don Haynes recognizes that in order to assess uh, atmospheric, and sorry, I'm looking at the paper, in order to ass assess, um, you know, atmospheric variables with respect to pressure levels, which are reported by radio sounds across the United States, you have to look at elevation. High elevation areas are in areas of lower atmospheric pressure, right? Because they're higher, they're higher above sea level. And so Don Haynes broke the United States down into three elevation levels, a low, a mid, and a high elevation area. So high elevation areas were largely the Western United States. Lower elevation areas were like the Gulf Coast states going off into New England and then up through the Mississippi and Ohio River Valleys. And then kind of Appalachia was the mid elevation index and kind of the Great Plains, Western Great Plains were some of the mid elevation index. And here's the map right there is to kind of how to outline that. But again, these breakpoints are pretty arbitrary in terms of elevation. Uh, never really states where these breakpoints come from. You know, and if you look at the map, Death Valley National Park, which is below sea level, if you look at the map, you know, it, Death Valley is should be using the high elevation Haynes Index. So some of it is pretty arbitrary. It doesn't necessarily make sense. I live in Rapid City. Rapid City is right on the border between a mid and a high elevation a Haynes Index. Which one do we use here? And that's not entirely clear. Um, if we go further into it, um, Don Haynes talks about these breakpoints, and you know I'll, I'll put the breakpoints up on the screen. Uh, for the low, there's the breakpoints there. The mid, the breakpoints there, and the high elevation Haynes index breakpoints there. And when I say breakpoints, I'm just talking about temperature lapse rates and dew point depressions. The the breakpoints were developed arbitrarily. What gives you a value of one, two, or three for the dryness term or the dew point depression term or a value of one, two, or three for the environmental lapse rate term is arbitrary. There's, there's no science that goes into what determines a two versus what determines a three. Um, you know, we tried to base it off of climatology, but it, it was a one-year climatology and there's just not enough data to establish these breakpoints. And so kind of the methods that go into it are, are, are definitely... Um, suspect. Uh, so yeah, anyway, once we've computed the LACI, again, we're, we're comparing this value of one, two, or three for dryness and a, a value for stability of one, two, or three. We add them together and we get a value of two going through six. And then, of course, we've, we, we talk about two um, all the way up to six in terms of, you know, will it be conducive to large wildland fire growth? And I'll actually talk more about that in section three of this Haynes Index video. But the most interesting part about the Haynes Index is Don Haynes states in his paper that there are a couple of areas of additional interest about the operational use of the LACI or the Lower Atmospheric Severity Index um, that might preclude it from being used in fire weather forecasts. One, the LACI might be strengthened by adding a third term to the equation dependent upon the low-level wind speed profile. The Haynes Index doesn't incorporate wind, and Don Haynes recognizes this. He understands that wind is very, very important to large wildland fire growth, right? Wind is a physical process that pushes fire across the landscape. Temperatures in the middle part of the troposphere, even the mid to lower part of the troposphere, are not a physical thing that's going to push fire across the landscape. He goes on to say that perhaps a wind term could be included later in an augmented version of the index. However, the 
Disagreement in the literature over the meteorological importance of various wind profiles, coupled with inconclusive results here, necessitates a delay until a clearer picture emerges of the impact of various wind profiles on large wildfires. Don Haynes says that this is incomplete, it's inconclusive, and we need a delay before we can use this as a forecasting metric. The second consideration that Don Haynes talks about is he states the present study was done primarily to establish the validity of meteorological parameters and methods used. Operational factors, though important, were secondary to accomplishing that goal. And what Don Haynes means by operational factors Forecasting, operational meteorology, bringing this index into operations. That wasn't a primary concern of what Don Haynes was trying to accomplish. He goes on to say, for forecasting, the 1200 Zulu, or the morning observation to the morning weather balloon launch, might be better used, but this could mean that the results from the analysis would change to some extent, because he used zero Zulu observations. Uh, from the weather balloons. If we wanted to use it from a forecasting standpoint, say at a 0600 AM briefing, maybe we could use the 12 Zulu weather balloon launch, which is a morning weather balloon launch, to then forecast the Haynes Index. But of course, we would have to look at different correlations because zero Zulu was used within this paper. And the kind of the concluding remark that Don Haynes has about the Lacey is he states that this is a first effort at constructing a national fire weather index based on features of the lower atmosphere, even though it will undoubtedly require further refinement and or additional components. Don Haynes recognizes that it's incomplete, it's inconclusive, and it will undoubtedly require further refinements. So take it from the horse's mouth. If Don Haynes says that we shouldn't be using the Haynes Index in the original Haynes Index paper, then maybe we shouldn't be using it in 2022. So again, this is just part one. I'm going to go through part two and part three with you all. Part two is going to cover why the Haynes Index really isn't a stability metric. And part three is going to cover the misuse of the Haynes Index. So I appreciate you listening. Any questions or comments, feel free. Uh, send me an email, give me a phone call, and we can talk more about uh, why we shouldn't be using the Haynes Index in wildland fire management. Thanks.